Jurassic World Dominion has recently revealed to us that its opening prologue, one that can be seen early only if you catch Fast and Furious 9 in IMAX, is going to contain an entire Cretaceous era prehistoric sequence wherein the origins of the 1993 T-Rex are said to be revealed. Now, in this opening sequence for Dominion, they're showing us a lot of clues and interesting information as to how the Jurassic Park franchise is going to tackle paleo or scientific accuracy for the new movie. And since it's right around the corner, I wanted to break it all down and go go over all of it today. Hey guys, hope you're all doing well. Now for today's video, the discussion on paleontological accuracy for Jurassic World Dominion has been a rather interesting one because ever since Colin Trevorrow revealed to everyone that the opening prologue would be set during the Cretaceous period, we've gotten an understanding that not all of the dinosaurs that existed within their correct timelines would actually be present in a more accurate carbon dating state to what Jurassic Park is promising to deliver. However, there has also been a lot of feathered dinosaur reveals that are equating this prehistoric segment to actually show case realistic dinosaurs in a way that Jurassic Park has never done before. And there are even hints that some of the animals that we're already familiar with, a la the Tyrannosaur, will also come with a different design as well to help hammer home the idea that the animal's engine has cloned were, to quote Dr. Wu, very different since their DNA was never pure, which is something that we're going to go deep into in just a little bit. But before we go any further, I want to take some time to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Now, if you don't know what Skillshare is just yet, it's described as an online learning community with literally thousands of inspiring classes for creators that I actually just joined myself, by the way. The main reason being due to the ability I'd have to explore new skills I'd always wanted to acquire, deepen existing passions within filmmaking, and for other creators, I'm sure it's a great place to get lost in creativity. Now, the class topics that I'm taking up immediately and the ones that I think you guys would like as well include film production or how to organize a shoot, going viral, write, film, and make content people share, as well as learn indie filmmaking by making a short film by Olaf de Flor, which I'm actually in the middle of right now. It looks to be something that will have the main takeaway of getting film fans like me a better understanding on how to actually produce something of quality content on their own. So it's something that I'm really looking forward to completing before making my own short film. But even then, for those of you who like the more visual effects oriented side of things, there's this really cool class called Realistic Dinosaurs sculpting and ZBrush for game and film, which I'm also probably going to watch sometime down the line. Now what makes Skillshare really cool is the fact that it's actually curated for learning and it has like zero ads. And Skillshare is always launching premium classes so you can stay focused and follow whoever or wherever your creative ideas take you. I'm really enjoying the combination of video lessons and creator projects. You get unlimited access to thousands of these online classes with hands-on feedback and just a really good environment to hone your skills. It's also super easy to manage since it's only 10 dollars a month for an annual subscription, but just for you guys, the first 1,000 subscribers of mine to click the link in my description will get a free trial of premium membership to explore their own creativity. I really think this is a product that will do nothing but benefit people in the long run, so once again, thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video, and I hope you all check out the link in the description and enjoy their content. Now, back to the video. Now when it comes to the different designs of the animals within Jurassic World Dominion, we need to take into account the synopsis for the prologue first and foremost. Because within that description it's revealed that one of John Hammond's infamous mosquitoes is going to take the blood from a dying T-Rex specifically. And if you look at the poster that actually came released with this information, here you can see that the dinosaur the mosquito is actually drinking blood from has some downy looking fuzz on its body. In other words, the Rex in the prehistoric age is probably going to be part partially feathered. Now, I literally just got done talking to a paleontologist on the scientific accuracy of Tyrannosaurus rex in an hour-long video that went up on the channel a little while ago, and I do find it interesting that Jurassic World has opted to use featherings on the rex in this prehistoric sequence since all the speculation of Tyrannosaur feathering doesn't really come from T-Rex itself and is actually taken from other animals in the Tyrannosaur family that are different from it. But since paleontology is a science that is far less objective than something like, say, physics or astrology, I can see why they opted to go down that route for their Cretaceous throwback. And I only say paleontology isn't exactly an exact science as other things that currently exist because literally so much of it is based off of just speculation. But I should also point out that Michael Crichton himself wrote downy feathers on the infant tyrannosaurs in the Lost World novel, so there is still that point of reality to consider. Now when it comes 
comes to paleo accuracy of something like the era in which all of these animals lived, I will say that this was something of a bummer that I felt when I first heard the news. Although I will also say that after seeing these images and hearing about the scene itself, it has made me very excited. The thing about paleo accuracy in Jurassic World Dominion is that it has to follow in what came before it in order to actually be some semblance of importance to the original Jurassic Park. And there are things in the original Jurassic Park that set up a very different prehistoric world than the one we know in reality. Such as Alan Grant's insistence that the Tyrannosaurus Rex's eyesight is based on movement, which is obviously something that no paleontologist believed back then or believes right now. There's also the reclassification of Velociraptor, which, for those of you who know me well, was one of the biggest disappointments I ever felt in relation to paleo accuracy and Jurassic Park. In fact, I remember my friend uh, Kirsten Formosa Moso, who was working in that scientific field all the time, she actually showed me the evidence that they had made it canon that the raptors in Jurassic Park were Mongoliensis and not Anteropus, and she was joking with me about how much it was a bummer, and yeah, that really did annoy the hell out of me, because you see, there are times when paleocentric people have pushed against Jurassic Park because it simply is Jurassic Park, and they're on some sort of idealistic crusade to destroy the evil capitalistic franchise that is oppressing these real-life animals so bad, and it just gets such a cringe from a lot of paleontologist friends that I know of who look at Twitter and they roll their eyes. And the changing of Velociraptor was a casualty from those people that I think we all kind of got upset over. I will say, though, that a push for more paleo-accurate dinosaurs, specifically feathered dinosaurs, has been something I've wanted to see for a very long time. And Jurassic World Dominion is doing that in spades for its Cretaceous sequence. The Moros Intrepidus is, of course, going to have a lot of very fluffy plumage, and it is by far the most realistic looking dinosaur in terms of what that whole feathered aspect that I believe we've seen ever in Jurassic Park history, but please do correct me if I'm wrong on that. Then of course there is the dinosaur that I'm most excited to see in the opening, which is Oviraptor. When Colin Trevorrow teased a fully feathered Oviraptor that would be running around at the beginning of the film, I actually got way more hyped than I think anyone else in the world did for that dinosaur, because this is an animal that I've grown up loving, and to finally see it not only in a Jurassic Park movie, but also done in that way is really something that I think needs to be commended. Now when it comes to the actual real life dates that all of these dinosaurs existed in, here's the facts. Moros Intrepidus realistically lived in Utah during the Cretaceous. Quetzalcoatlus lived alongside T-Rex during the late Cretaceous. Giganotosaurus realistically lived in Argentina about 97 million years ago in the Cretaceous, which is before the time of the Quetzal and Rex's real world events. The European early Cretaceous Iguanodon is also sharing its environment with with Nasutoceratops, which lived in Utah in the late Cretaceous. Oviraptor is a late Cretaceous Asian dinosaur. The late Cretaceous Pteranodon hails from a wide variety of North American states. And Dreadnoughtus is another interesting one because it comes from Argentina like the Giga, but is also present in the upper Cretaceous rock formations. All in all, this is kind of reminding me of the way the 1999 Walking with Dinosaurs episode went that had the Utah Raptors attack the Iguanodon as far as accurate time and locations go, but when it comes to the dinosaur designs themselves, there is a lot of interesting stuff going on here. I think one of the really interesting things with Jurassic Park that nobody really talks about because either they've got their nostalgia goggles on or they just don't know any better, is the whole presentation of dinosaurs and their split between real world science and Jurassic Park universe science. Billy Brennan in Jurassic Park 3 mentions that he thinks that the animal that they looked at on Isla Sorna, the Spinosaurus, could be a Suchomimus, and he names that off as being something that was on Engine's list. But Suchomimus wasn't known of until 1997, so, you know, they'd been cloning animals, obviously pre-93, so you got that to consider as well. Now, I bring this up because even if you look at something like The Lost World, where we have a baby T-Rex as the focal point of the movie in terms of dinosaur characters, I'm willing to bet over 90% of you guys have never even thought of the fact that the Rexes were only raising one individual, and that no other siblings were ever even mentioned as having existed in that film, which isn't exactly accurate as to what we would assume would be the case for a clutch of eggs in a tyrannosaur nest. It wasn't even accurate to the Crichton novel, in which it was based on, where there were multiple hatchlings. Now, I'm saying this is something we assume would be the case, because, like I said at the beginning of this video, paleontological accuracy is something that is reliant heavily on speculation. So much so that apart from the obvious issues in dinosaur coexistence, Existence, a lot of this stuff set during the Cretaceous is simply more accurate designs based on modern paleontological theory or 
debate. So there's really quite little to discuss, at least before any of us see the prologue with our own eyes, of course. But with that being said, I just want you guys to know that these are all just my own thoughts on the subject matter before having seen the opening, which my opinions will obviously change once that comes out. So I'd like to see what all of you guys have to say about this information in the comments down below. What are your thoughts and opinions on the available info that we have so far, and how do you think the film will play out once it's fully released next year? Now, whatever your own thoughts and opinions happen to be at this current state and time, I'd love to hear them in the comments down below. Now before I go, I'd like to thank all of my game wardens, as well as all of my engine executives. I'd also like to thank all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. Guys, it seriously means the world to me that you all continue to support what I do, and I never want you to ever forget that. Now, I'd like to thank you all for watching today's video and hope you all enjoyed the content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like and hope that you'll consider subscribing if you're interested in seeing me again. See you all in the next video, guys, and as always, take it easy.